All right, everybody. Let's get this program started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It is good to be with you on this Wednesday here at noon for our program for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, brought to you by the folks at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality and us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I am your host. My name is Chris Smith. I work here at the museum. And as always, it's good to be with you. Uh, this is a great program because we get to meet interesting people doing interesting things and thinking about interesting topics out there in the worlds of science and nature, conservation, education, and more. Although I have to say that it's normally how I start the program as I say those things. It's a little bit weird today because, well, you got me. Hi, everybody. Today, your guest speaker is Chris Smith at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. That's right. I don't know. Maybe they ran out of people to ask to do the program. Either way, it's good to be with you, and uh, we're going to have a great time. I've got some really cool stories to share with you about the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Not too long ago, me and a colleague of mine, Greg Scoopian, started putting together this experience that we were offering here at the museum called Museum Untold. And the idea was that we would show people around the museum and tell them stories, secrets, uh, maybe show them things in the museum that we thought were often overlooked by people coming and walking through the museum. And we took all of those stories and compiled them into this tour, this guided tour that we would do of the museum called Museum Untold. And uh, well, Lisa and Marty heard about this tour, and I guess they thought that folks within the Environmental Education Network might be a little bit interested in some of these really cool stories. Of course, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences is the largest natural history museum, of course, in North Carolina, and it's one of the biggest science museums in all of the Southeast, which means that we've got like a lot of stories that we can tell. And in the time that I have today, uh, I'm going to try to not be one of those guest speakers that goes really long, but uh, I am known for talking. So we're going to see how it goes. So everybody, uh, Chris Smith is the coordinator for current science programs at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where he's been for seven years as an event producer, a science communicator, and a host for most of the museum's events. You can find him on Instagram and on Twitter and on stage inside the Daily Planet Theater. And he joins us now. Hi, Chris. Welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. It's great to be here. Let's get started. All right. We did the introductions. So, Museum Untold, everybody. Let's get into it. So, I was trying to figure out what story to start with. Like, what's going to be the best story to tell you all first? And I decided to start with something that's not actually too much of a secret, at least something that's not exactly like hiding in the museum, because it happens to be one of the biggest things in the museum. Uh, everybody sees it when they come to the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences here in downtown Raleigh. And it's one of our giant whale skeletons. This is the skeleton of Mayflower. Mayflower is a North Atlantic right whale. The skeleton is hanging. You can see it on the first and second floors in the Nature Exploration Center building. So that's the kind of older building of the museum. Uh, and this skeleton has been a part of the museum for a very long time. And the way that the museum came about this skeleton has a lot to say about the history of North Carolina's coast uh, and just sort of how museums operate. Uh, Mayflower actually is one of, one of the whales that was hunted and killed by whalers off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, in 18, either 1874 or 1876, the records are just slightly fuzzy, whalers rode out and hunted and killed this animal. Uh, of course, you've probably heard of like whale blubber or whale oil that would be used for lamps or at the sort of turn of the century, whale oil was even sometimes used as a lubricant for machinery that was becoming popular. And in order to get that oil, people had to go out and hunt and kill whales. And in North Carolina, this took place not like you see here, which is maybe what we often think of where, you know, you'd be out in the open ocean tracking down the whales, hunting and killing them and then processing them off the boat. But whaling in North Carolina happened right on the beaches. So if you're visiting the Museum of Natural Sciences, you're down in our Coastal Carolina exhibit, 
you can imagine maybe somebody sitting up on a sand dune, looking out over the ocean, and just looking for a big whale to swim by. When they would see one, they would sound an alarm, ring a bell, let everybody know, and then all of the whalers would come jump in the rowboats and then head out to go take the animals. They'd have their spears, they'd have their harpoons, they'd have their ropes. Mayflower, of course, this is what happened to her. Um, but Mayflower's story ends up being a little bit different because Mayflower became quite famous. Mayflower was actually a, an animal that put up the biggest fight, they said, of any whale they had ever seen. So the whalers wrote later, recounting the fight, that Mayflower actually put up a fight that lasted more than six hours. Six hours of struggle in order to kill the animal. And it was customary for whalers to name their kills. So the name Mayflower was actually given to that whale as they brought it back to the beach. May for the month that she was killed in, and flower because of the marking that they noticed on her side that kind of looked like a flower. Mayflower. Isn't that something? So the whalers process the animal. They, they get their oil, probably took the baleen plates out of the mouth, the filter feeding device that these big whales use, sold all of that stuff. But then we get to the skeleton. What were they going to do with the skeleton? Somehow, and this is part of the story that I'm not too certain of, a man named John Whitford, who was one of Eastern North Carolina's uh, like rich political types. He was well-connected. He was the president of the North Carolina and Atlantic Railroads. Kind of maybe like an evil villainy type, you know, the type that would like see a giant whale skeleton and think, you know what? I want that. Anyway, uh, somehow he gets a hold of the skeleton. But then 1876, he turns around and donates the skeleton to the state of North Carolina. Which is interesting because at this point in history, there was not a state museum. There wasn't a natural history museum. The Museum of Natural Sciences was actually just a collection of minerals, timber products, and agricultural products, which you can see in the sort of sepia tone photo on the far side of the screen from me. Uh, what we would do is we would pack all of these things up, put them on a train or in trucks, and then haul them around the country and display all of North Carolina's sort of natural wealth as a way of encouraging people to come do business here in the state. Well, in 1879, this is three years after Mayflower skeleton gets donated to the museum, the General Assembly would actually, by legislation, create a museum. They would say, take all of these minerals and the gems and the timber products and the agricultural products, all this nature stuff that we've collected, and turn that into a museum, make it available to the people. If you look at this photo from about 1880, you can see Mayflower skeleton stashed away. If you look under the tables that are sort of uh, stretched out through the middle of the photograph, down there underneath those tables of timber slabs, those are the bones of Mayflower. Now, the state would hire its first director several years later, its first full-time employee and then director, and that was this guy you see pictured here, Herbert Hutchinson Brimley, who around here we call H.H. H. Brimley. Come 1896, Brimley would actually set about the task of articulating the skeleton, putting it all back together, figuring out which bones went where, and then hanging the skeleton for the public to see. It apparently was no small task. Uh, at this point, there wasn't a whole lot of, say, writings and drawings to look at on North Atlantic right whale anatomy, but he got the job done. He also had to clean off, of course, at this point, something like 20, 21 years worth of dirt, dust, grime. And if you look really close in the photo of the old museum there, look along the edges of those bookcases, those collection cabinets on the floor, you can see spittoons. So Brimley probably also had to scrub off a lot of like tobacco juice in order to get these bones clean and put on exhibit. But 1896, Mayflower goes on exhibit to the public. Since then, Mayflower has been in a place of prominence and has been in the museum where people could see and learn about North Atlantic right whales. This actually makes Mayflower the longest exhibited specimen in the entire museum quite a superlative for quite an incredible creature. So in this photo here, you can actually see Mayflower hanging in the now museum. 
Uh, this is from the year 1900, actually. And if we go through the years just a little bit, like here's Mayflower in a different permutation of the museum hanging up. This photo is, I believe, from uh, like the early 1950s. And of course, you can come to the museum today and see Mayflower hanging up. Of course, today, North Atlantic right whales are considered one of the most endangered whales on the planet. Uh, at the height of whaling, say at the turn of the 20th century, so about the time that Mayflower was killed, there were probably only a couple hundred of these individuals remaining. By the 1930s, whaling would be made pretty much illegal uh, throughout North America. It wouldn't be too long after that uh, that whaling would become illegal in most countries around the world, especially getting into like the 60s and 70s with the Save the Whales movement and stuff like that. So you would think, oh, right, whales must be doing great. There's no more hunting pressure, except that today, North Atlantic right whales suffer pressure from things like climate changing, from ship strikes, getting hit and killed by ships, uh, and from getting tangled up in fishing gear, like ropes connected to lobster traps that are sunk to the bottom of the ocean to catch lobsters, but then ropes are connected to buoys up at the surface. Whales swim through them, get tangled up, can't swim, drown, die, uh, or otherwise uh, lose their ability to survive because, you know, they're they're tangled up in fishing gear. Um, today, scientists estimate that there are about 380 North Atlantic right whales remaining in the Atlantic Ocean. And, and that's it. And of those 380, they estimate that fewer than 100 of those are breeding females, right? Individuals that can actually add to the population and grow the population. Now, in recent decades, there have been awesome policies, rules that have been put in place to try to curb uh, things like how fast ships are going in and out of port as they move up and down the Atlantic coast of the United States so that they're not going fast enough to hit and kill ships. Specimens of right whales here at our museum were actually used for some of the research to help get rules like that put into place. So right whales are kind of in a tenuous place right now which is great because we have this specimen, Mayflower, where we can tell the whole story from pressures from whaling all the way through today to what it takes to continue to protect and conserve species like North Atlantic right whales, which really are just wonderful, gentle giants of the Atlantic Ocean. I didn't even mention like that a right whale can be more than 50 feet long. They can weigh 70 metric tons. And all they're doing is out there swimming around looking for krill and other whales to hang out with. But uh, let's see, I'm gonna look at the time. Oh my goodness, I've got so many more stories to tell you. Okay, if you're in the coastal hall and you're visiting the museum, you see the whales up above you and then you walk a little further down the hall and there at the end, you'll come to a fantastic diorama that we call Diving Pelican. Uh, at least, you know, those of us here at the museum tend to call it the Diving Pelican. And this exhibit actually happens to be a staff favorite. Uh, not too long ago, a little poll went out asking staff, so, you know, what's your favorite little thing in the museum? And this diorama right here ranked pretty high at the top. And if you look closely at it, you can kind of see why. I mean, one, it's it's beautiful, right? It's such an immersive look at this sound side marshy environment of coastal North Carolina. Uh, it's got gorgeous artwork with the mural in the back. You've got the birds, you've got the fish. But I'll draw your attention to my favorite part of the Diving Pelican exhibit. And it's something that I think goes overlooked. Visitors to the museum actually don't pay very much attention to it because they're distracted by like the pelican part of it, or they're distracted by the sea turtle part of it. And it's this piling. One, I like this piling because it's a, a hint of human influence in these environments. It's not just the animals. Here's something that is part of the human impact in any environment. But I think this piling actually happens to be the most colorful thing in the entire museum. At least it's on exhibit. I mean, look at this thing. Yeah, I, I enhanced and got up a little bit closer for you in the photo that's on the right side of the screen. Every single color in the rainbow is present on this one little piece of this one exhibit in the museum. And I think the artists and designers who were working on this did a particularly good job with it because, I mean, they were obviously paying attention to their color wheel, right? They were using some color theory here. Like, look, you've got green seaweeds next to sort of like reddish-tinged urchins and sea stars. You've got 
bright yellow corals that are next to blue sponges and sort of dark blue colored fish. Uh, and then you've got the white and the gray of the barnacles that you can see towards the bottom, which are put up against the really dark color of the wood of the piling. So everything on this just pops and stands out. And I like to show it to people just to be like, wow, they didn't just glue a bunch of stuff on here. They really got in and thought about how to make this uh, bright and colorful and engaging for somebody to want to look at. But of course, the thing that most people take pictures of when they visit the museum and the thing that gets the most attention, the showstopper, if you will, is the pelican. How could you miss it? It's right there in the middle, plunging down in this dramatic pose and posture. The wings are pinned back. The pelican pouch is wide open because it's just hit the surface in order to try to get a meal to try to catch some fish. So there's a lot of drama here. Uh, this exhibit, this diorama has so much um, emotion as well as motion, <laughs> both of those things. Uh, and I like, you know, let's just take a little bit of a closer look here. So if you look up at the pelican really close, uh, one, there's all this splashing effect of the bird having come through. So there's a splashing effect that's been built in. All of these plastic beads that look like bubbles are coming down all around the pelican's face. So it really does look like this bird just hit some actual water right inside of our museum. And then I like to say that this thing is full of drama in addition to just movement, because look at the look on this fish's face. Oh my gosh, is this fish gonna make it? I don't know. He's halfway in the pouch, halfway out of the pouch. When I'm showing people around the museum, I like to take a poll. Uh, who thinks the fish is gonna make it uh, away? And who fish that thinks, uh, thinks the fish is gonna be dinner for our pelican? Um, I've only had one person on any of the tours that I've given actually let the fish get away. I don't know what that says about us, but pretty much everybody always votes for the pelican. They're like, no, pelican gets the meal, which honestly, I kind of feel that way too. I think the pelican gets the meal in this case. Uh, pelicans, when they do this foraging behavior, this hunting behavior, they can dive from 60 feet up, reach 40 miles an hour when they hit the surface of the water. And because of the opening of their pouch and all that, when they hit the water, they almost come to a full and complete stop. They stretch out their long neck, they try to grab a fish, and then they come up. So that's a lot of effort to try to get a meal. And I feel like in this case, you know, the pelican maybe deserves it. Although we can feel sorry for the fish too. Isn't that a great face? Look of terror. Now in this exhibit, something that folks wouldn't know about because we don't really talk about it is how it all came together. Within Diving Pelican, of course, we've got the pelican coming through that water looking surface. Let me bring up the photo again for you. Take a look. Well, the exhibit designers actually had to pour that plastic for the water surface before we installed the taxidermy bird because that's a real pelican, right? And our bird guy, some folks on the call might know him, John Gerwin. He was calling around to wildlife rehabilitators and places like that saying, anybody got a dead pelican? We need a dead pelican for this exhibit. And we didn't have one to use. And uh, somebody that he called was like, oh yeah, actually we had one that passed away not too long ago that was in our care. Uh, it's still in the freezer. Come on down and get it. John goes, picks up the bird, and then we have it sent to professional taxidermy. And in a taxidermy like this, uh, whether you know about taxidermy or not, pretty much the shape of the bird as you see it here is how it came back to the museum in the box. And when it came back from the taxidermy, the wings are pinned back, they're wired up, the pouch is open and probably a little bit fragile. There's no repositioning it. So the artists and designers pour the surface for the plastic, but they only leave a hole about this big for the bird. We can't squeeze the whole bird in through a hole that's that big. So how do you figure we got it in there? If you'd say you got a saw and you cut the head off the bird, bing, you're right. Because that's exactly what we had to do. We cut the head off the bird, warm, you know, and then maybe not quite that dramatic. And then, you know, put the head on the top, uh, put the head on the bottom, put the body on the top, screw them back together. Well, not screw them back together, but put the two pieces together, 
through the hole in the surface. And then they added all of that splash effect that you can see here in order to hide the seam of having had to separate this bird from its head. So a lot of that artistry that went in right there hides the seam as well as gives us this great artistic and splashing effect. Isn't that cool stuff? I think maybe some of that is why this one is so much fun. Okay, uh, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. We've talked about a couple of wildlife, but here at the museum, we collect a lot more things than just dead animals. We also have a pretty nice gem and mineral collection. And some of the gems and minerals that we have are pretty special to us here in North Carolina. If you are a North Carolinian, then gold is in your heritage, whether you're a transplant or not, you get to claim it. Um, tucked away at sort of the very back corner of our geology exhibit of the North Carolina underground section is a case that's labeled gold. And then in the very middle of that case is this tiny little nugget. Uh, I didn't include a scale here, but the pedestal that it's on is only about two inches wide. So this small gold nugget is a nugget of gold from the Reed Gold Mine, which is out close to the city of Charlotte. So it's out in Western North Carolina. And the Reed Gold Mine is the site of the first documented gold find in the United States. If I say the words gold rush, most folks think of California, they think of San Francisco. They think of the year 1849, maybe, if they were really paying attention to their history books. But as many people who are on this call might know, the first gold rush in the United States happened right here in North Carolina. Yeah, that's right. Right here in our backyards. The story begins in the year 1799. So we're, what, 50 years before the California gold rush? Uh, a 12-year-old boy named Conrad Reed is out playing in a creek uh, instead of going to church with his parents, with his dad, John. And uh, he comes home from the creek with a 17-pound yellow rock. That's right. He found a 17-pound gold nugget. Well, I mean, gosh, if you're John Reed, what do you do with a 17-pound gold nugget? You set it on the floor and you use it for a doorstop for fully three years. That's right. By all accounts, they didn't know that it was a nugget of gold. Didn't know what it was. It was just a cool, bright colored rock. 1802, though, uh, maybe just on a whim, I'm not sure. John Reed carries this big, heavy gold nugget to a jeweler in Fayetteville who probably immediately recognized it for what it was, but then offered John Reed, I want to buy it from you. Uh, how much will you take for it? John Reed thinks about it for a second and uh, reportedly says, well, how about a week's wages on the farm? $3.50. $3.50. Folks, in 1802 dollars, that is one-tenth of one percent of what that gold nugget was worth. Yes, John Reed got swindled. Takes his three fifty and goes back to uh, the outskirts of modern-day Charlotte, goes back to Western Carolina. Uh, so he gets swindled. But a 17-pound gold nugget showing up in a jewelry store in Fayetteville, yeah, it's going to set off a gold rush. So people start flocking into the area around John Reed's farm looking for gold. You can imagine John Reed himself figures out what's happened pretty quick. By some accounts, he actually went back to that jeweler and like got some more money out of him. But John Reed then sets up the Reed gold mine and starts uh, and goes into business with some local friends and family in order to start digging gold out of the creeks and streams that's on his farm and property. And then pretty soon thereafter, he starts digging into the earth, looking for gold as well. A bunch of gold mines pop up all over Western North Carolina where people are seeking their fortunes and looking for gold. And so much gold was actually coming out of North Carolina at the time through the early half of the 1800s that the U.S. government actually set up a branch mint in basically in Charlotte, uh, even a little bit maybe before it was the city of Charlotte, but they set up a branch mint because there's so much gold. Let's just get it out of the ground and get it into the mint, stamp it into gold coins, and much of the nation's gold coins was coming out of that. Now, you sort of wrap this whole story up and think about the history of North Carolina, particularly the city of Charlotte. Today, Charlotte is 
something like the third largest banking city in the U.S. Like uh, there's two or three national and multinational banks that have headquarters or are headquartered in the city of Charlotte. I think like some of the biggest skyscrapers in the city belong to some of these really big banks. And all of that is because a 12-year-old boy pulled a gold nugget out of the ground in 1799. That's pretty wild stuff to think about. So uh, here at the museum, when you come to visit, you can actually see a recreation of the Reed gold mine. We build a little ground for him here. Uh, the story is that exhibit designers went, looked at the Reed gold mine, took some pictures, came back and built the thing right here. And then we also had some antique mining implements and tools. So we stored them inside here as a way of exhibiting them. But it also brings me back to the gold nugget that we started with there at the beginning. Uh, this particular gold nugget is, in fact, a nugget of gold from the Reed Gold Mine. It came from a collection in Germany. John Reed himself, it turns out, was German. He actually came to the United States to fight in the Revolutionary War for the British. He was a German mercenary called a Hessian, but he really wasn't into this whole fighting a war thing. So he defects from the British army and travels west to where he hears there are German settlements, a.k.a. Western North Carolina. When he gets there, he starts farming uh, and then eventually, you know, hits it rich. But we have evidence that John Reed was sending gold back to family in Germany. So there's every indication that this little gold nugget that's on exhibit in the museum could quite possibly bear the fingerprints of John Reed himself having pulled it out of the ground or having had one of his business partners or, it must be said, likely enslaved people doing some of this work or a lot of it, uh, pulled this out of the ground and then boxed it up and sent it to Germany, where then it ended up being traded, bought, sold, moved around collections until it was acquired by a gentleman who was collecting gems and minerals specifically from North Carolina. That was his passion. And then that collection became a part of the Museum of Natural Sciences. However, however, big exclamation point on this. Any records that would have directly tied this nugget of gold to John Reed himself was lost in World War II. They were destroyed. So we don't really know for sure. The locality matches, the timing kind of matches, but anything for certain is, well, seems to be lost to history at this point. But there it is, the nugget of gold. You can come see it. And it's right across from that replica of the Reed Gold Mine itself. Crazy story, right? Isn't that wild? Biggest city in, in North Carolina, Charlotte, banking capital, 12-year-old boy. Love it. That's the stuff museums are made of. Well, now let's move on to something, a story that folks actually probably know. Uh, it's a story that I love to tell, but uh, in recent years, we haven't told it so much here at the museum. The exhibit panels have changed. That, of course, happens. That's natural. Uh, but I think it's great that we can uh, continue to tell some of these stories. So this is a sperm whale. And it has a very special name. This sperm whale is Trouble. Trouble got its name because Trouble was a lot of trouble to get to the Museum of Natural Sciences. When we say Trouble, we mean Trouble. Now, Trouble, the sperm whale, washed up on Wrightsville Beach in April of 1928. Uh, it was quite the sight. Of course, in 1928, there's there's not like YouTube or Netflix. There's no lunchtime discovery series to tune into. So what do you do? You jump in the car, you grab your cool 1920s three-piece suit or those cool hats that the ladies would wear, you know, with their like bob haircuts and all that. And you go look at the giant dead whale that's washed up on the beach. Uh, over the space of just a few days, something like 15,000 people would come to see this whale washed up on Wrightsville Beach. Well, the mayor of Wrightsville Beach is very excited about this. All these people are coming to see this animal, but he also now has kind of a public health crisis on his hands because there's a big 54-foot-long dead rotting whale on the beach. What are we going to do with it? Well, the first thing the mayor does, he contracts a towboat, says, drag it out in the ocean, get rid of it. But also, our guy Brimley, the director of the museum, remember? 
he gets word of this whale washed up on the beach and he and the mayor converse and he's like, well, if you can come get the whale, come get the whale. I'm only going to give you a few days to do it, though, because I need it off of the beach. Right. It's April. Tourist season is coming up. I don't need a big uh, rotting whale on the beach. So Brimley and his colleague, Harry Davis, they load up some tools, they jump on a truck and they go to Wrightsville Beach. When they get there, they take a bunch of pictures to document it. But then they also go ahead and saw off the bottom jaw of the whale. They say, we might not be able to get the whole skeleton, but at least we can cut off the jaw. We can bury it here on the beach in the sand. We'll leave it in the charge of the chief of police. And then we'll come back on another day, dig that up. We'll see what we can do here. Brimley gets in touch with the towboats and works with them and works with a buddy of his who happens to have a private beach up in Topsail at the time to say, hey, let's tow it off of Wrightsville Beach. Let's take it up to Topsail. We'll stash it there. And then we can do the work of butchering the animal and removing all of the bones, cleaning them before we bring it back to Raleigh. OK, that's going to work. Brimley hires the towboat, and this is where we start to get in a little bit of trouble. Brimley gets the boat. They wrap the whale up in ropes, go to pull it off the sand. Guess what? Whale doesn't budge, doesn't move an inch, just suctions into the sand. So then Brimley, uh, the tunnel underneath the whale, basically wrap the thing up in ropes. And then kind of like a ripcord on a top, they barrel roll the whale into the ocean. But now it's at least it's off the beach. It's in the water. Towboat heads up towards topsail. Well, for reasons that may not ever be really known to us, they get about a mile from the drop point at Topsail Beach and set the whale adrift. Just like, cut the ropes, whale's gone. Don't really know why. Maybe there was miscommunication about what to do with the whale. Maybe there was another boat that was supposed to pick it up and the they miscommunicated on the transfer of the whale. But anyway, now our whale is just like out there. So we get another boat to go out and get the whale. But it's a very small boat. So this little tiny boat is struggling to get trouble the rest of the way to Topsail. And then a freak storm comes up that threatens to capsize the boat and the whale and the people on the boat. The Coast Guard sees what's going on and they actually get suspicious. The Coast Guard comes out and actually thinks that our tiny little towboat is trawling for caches of rum on the bottom of the ocean. So they go out to investigate only to find they're just trying to drag a whale up the beach. So apparently the Coast Guard was like, well, we can help and helps get our whale the rest of the way to Topsail. They get it to Topsail. Everybody's like, "Whoo, what a day. Stake it into the beach. We'll come back another day and finish this work later. Of course, trouble would continue to be trouble. Brimley and Davis come back. They go to look for their whale. They're standing on the beach and there's no whale. It's gone. No whale on the beach. Either the ropes broke, somebody cut them maybe because they had heard about this whole whale debacle and they weren't into it. Davis looks out into the ocean and about a half mile out, stuck on a shoal, is trouble the sperm whale. So they say, you know what? Forget it. We'll just do the work of butchering the animal out there. They hire a few local uh, fishermen, give them like axes and shovels, and they head out and do the work standing in hip-deep ocean water. At this point, Trouble's been dead for at least a few days, probably stinks something terribly, and they're going to be standing uh, in the water and on this little platform that they build in order to do the work. You can imagine it was not very much fun. You can see the evidence of how much fun this job was on the skeleton itself hanging in the museum today. So let's take a look close up at Trouble's jaw. See all of these tick marks along the edges, all these big gashes and scars in the bone, how it looks kind of rough? That is because they were using not exactly museum quality tools or museum quality uh, skill sets for preparing specimens to butcher this animal and doing it under just like not very much fun conditions and it bears the marks of it. Uh, you can also look down on the spine of the animal, look down the vertebra. If you look on that like second vertebra from the right, you'll notice there's a big chunk of it that's missing, this area right up in here. Uh, you can look down here onto this vertebra and see that this little piece that would stick forward off the front, that's broken off. 
Generally, the skeleton looks a little bit rough. And that is because this work was not done by, you know, like professional museum folks, uh, but done by whoever we could hire to do some not much fun work. All evidence there on the skeleton. Uh, a few days after getting the welder's topsail and starting this work, they go back to Wrightsville Beach, actually, to look for that bottom jaw. So, you know, for example, here's trouble. Here's our skeleton without its bottom jaw. When Harry Davis goes looking for the jaw in Wrightsville Beach, guess what? Trouble was trouble. It's gone. Totally gone. And to this day, it is pretty much lost to history. We don't know what happened to it. Uh, you know, maybe it was there on the beach and a storm came through and just washed it out to sea. That could have happened. Uh, also, though, sperm whale teeth are made of ivory. Somebody who knew that sperm whale teeth are made of ivory would have known that that bottom jaw was worth a little bit of money and probably would have swiped it. We don't really know what happened. Can't say either way. But trouble today hanging in the museum does have a bottom jaw. So where did that bottom jaw come from? If we don't have Trouble's actual jaw, what happened? In 1929, Brimley is thinking about getting the skeleton hung and articulated in the museum, and he sends letters to all of his museum buddies around the country asking if anybody happens to have a bottom jaw for a sperm whale that'll fit one about 55 feet long. A curator at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City writes back and says, oh yeah, I got one of those. I would be happy to send it to you. However, it's in my personal collection. So uh, it'll cost you $40 plus shipping and handling. Brimley writes back and is like, maybe something many of us can relate to. Writes back and says, uh, I can pay for the jaw, sure. But we are a state museum and our appropriation uh, at this moment is not as where I would like it to be. So uh, can you work with me on the shipping and handling? Anyway, they negotiate it out. It gets shipped by rail to North Carolina. The jaw gets here. It's only got two teeth in it. Brimley takes those out, fashions 42 teeth out of plaster and molding materials, inserts them into the jaw. And in 1930, trouble goes on exhibit to the public. Uh, these whales in the museum, now you've met two of them, Mayflower and Trouble, represent two fantastic specimens of these animals, and our whale collection here at the museum represents one of the largest on-exhibit collections of whales in the United States. So this one, uh, Trouble would actually go on to be the logo for the museum for many, many years, up until like 2012 when we built the Nature Research Center wing of the museum and changed the logo and did some rebranding stuff. Uh, so Trouble is actually quite a famous specimen, part of the reason being that it just had this long storied history. Even in the like 1990s, we had to take Trouble out of the museum because Trouble was full of asbestos, had to do this whole remediation thing. Uh, it's all great and good now. Trouble's probably going to just stay in that spot, though. I don't think we're planning on moving it or doing anything with it besides letting people look at it for a long time. Isn't that a great story? Love that one. By the way, I see there's lots of stuff coming in in the chat. Uh, I'm going to pull up the YouTube chat in just a little while and start looking at your questions and comments. So make sure you're dropping things in there, questions you've got about the specimens. I am no expert on all of these things, even though I am pretending to be one right now, but I'll be happy to answer what questions I can. But I do have one more story that I want to tell you in the time that I've got. Uh, and it happens to be about this little piece of history that we have inside the museum as well. Uh, we call big slices of tree like this tree cookies, which is just a fun name for them. This one in particular that's in the Nature Research Center, so the building that we constructed in 2012 and opened on Earth Day of that year, is a slice of bald cypress tree that was cut down sometime around 1913. And of course, uh, lots of museums, you get these big slices of tree, you put them on exhibit, uh, and people like them because we learn, I feel like, from a pretty young age that you can count the rings in a tree, at least deciduous trees like this, in order to get at how old the tree is. If you want to know how old it is, count the rings, pretty simple stuff. It's actually kind of a complicated science, but generally, this is something that we know and that we love about trees. And so uh, this piece of bald cypress has been a part of the museum for quite some time. Of course, uh, we don't really let people do this 
anymore in the exhibits. If you stand in the exhibit to try to take a selfie with this slice of tree, somebody will come along, probably me, and ask you to please <laughs> step outside of the exhibit. These are probably like uh, children of museum employees and curators, probably like a marketing photo for the museum, but fun stuff. But that is the same piece of tree that you can see on exhibit in the Nature Research Center right now. And a thing that museums like to do when they get these big slices of trees is that they like to try to use them to give people a sense of how old the tree is and like a, a passage of time. And so as you can see in this photo, uh, which I believe this is after 1950 at least, you can see that they marked up the tree rings with what they thought were dates in history that were significant that maybe people could relate to or identify with in some way. And that would give them a sense of the passage of time. So of course you start in the middle and you say, oh, okay, this is when the tree started growing. But then I started looking at these dates on this tree, uh, and to me, they are quite funny because there's like – there's nothing etched onto this tree that mattered to the tree. And in fact, there's only a few dates on here that even really mattered to the history of the state of North Carolina. Uh, certainly none of this information mattered to the tree. Like the, the this tree did not care – that in 1302, there was a mariner's compass invented in Europe, okay? I'm not even sure, like, oh, that's probably a significant thing in history. But really, that's the reference point that we're going to put <laughs> on the tree? I'm sure they had great logic for it then. But of course, I also look at all of these historical dates that they've plastered onto this tree, uh, and I think, wow, all of this information uh, is very, like, white European-centric history, this cypress tree was living and growing in North Carolina before contact with uh, colonists and settlers, white people essentially coming into this part of the world. And so there's a ton of history that if we wanted to mark up a tree living and growing in North Carolina for, in this case, uh, very nearly 800 years, then uh, these aren't the dates that we might want to use, which is why I really like and appreciate that when this cypress cookie went back on exhibit into the Nature Research Center, they got rid of all of that. Scrape off all of those dates. Let's actually find some information that mattered to the tree. And in fact, information about this piece as a specimen in a natural history museum that relates and is relative to why it's here. We don't have this tree cookie to give people a sense of the passage of time or historical events uh, in a small group of people's history, it's actually here because this piece of tree holds a record of the way the world used to be, right? If you look at tree rings, they can tell you about things like past climate patterns where it was growing. So in southeastern North Carolina, where the cypress was growing, for example, in the 1550 to 1850 range, the tree rings are very, very small. That means it's cold or it's very dry or both. Growing conditions are poor for the tree, so it doesn't create very much wood and you get a thin ring. If you look at this warm, wet period in another part of the tree's history, you get thick, fat rings. Conditions are good for growing, so the tree puts down a lot of wood. And using something like this cookie as a record, knowing when it was cut, being able to count back, and then uh, do a little bit of science we can actually piece together ancient climate patterns throughout North Carolina's history. And of course, records like this get used by scientists all over the world to try to help us piece together the way the world used to be. Um, and that's important because, well, some of these places are actually quite special. In southeastern North Carolina, where that piece of cypress tree came from, there are cypress trees that are much, much older. There are records of North Carolina's history present in, for example, what we're looking at here, the Three Sisters Swamp on the Black River in the southeastern part of our state. Uh, researchers from the University of Arkansas have actually gone and cored trees, taken little pieces out of them where you drill all the way through the middle and take a sliver of it that's about the size of a number two pencil, about the width of a pencil. And then you do the same thing. You can count the rings. You can do some analysis. Um, and Dr. David Staley and his team at the University of Arkansas have found cypress trees living and growing today in southeastern North Carolina 
that are more than 2,600 years old. They found one that was 2,624 years old at the time of publication of their paper. Um, that's a very old tree. And it's today under the care and protection of the Nature Conservancy, which has set aside the Three Sisters Swamp uh, under conservation protections. So those records, the information that's housed in that tree core, that's in these trees, and in these special places is all protected, preserved, and through you know museum specimens like we have here and through the work of researchers like this made available to everyone visiting the museum and made available to scientists and researchers. And that is kind of what it means to be a natural history museum, right? We don't just have the tree cookie for everybody to look at it and go, wow, we don't just have the whale skeleton for everyone to look at and go, cool. Those things are here so that people can see them, learn about them, but also for scientists to be able to come in, see them, learn about them, and use them to contribute more knowledge to what we know about the natural world, and for us in particular, the natural world here in North Carolina. We can learn about the way the world used to be, the way the world is today, and we can use all that information, especially if we think about a topic like climate change, uh, to predict or think about the way the world could be in the very near to even very far future. Because we have all of these snapshots of time here in the Museum of Natural Sciences, we get to be a part of the public education, the public enjoyment, and the scientific creation of knowledge through all of that. And ultimately, that is what it means to be a natural history museum like we are. So uh, with that, I am going to say thank you to quite a number of people uh, who have done the research and work of pulling so many of these stories together, imagery together, who shared very willingly and openly their stories, or in even some cases published them in places where I could easily find them in order to relay them to you here today. So uh, there's probably even people on this list that I have not acknowledged, and I apologize for that. Uh, and they are welcome to jump into the chat and claim their credit, and I will give it to them freely. So, thanks everybody. Uh, let's now turn to you and your questions. It looks like the chat was going off. So uh, I've got the chat down here. I'm gonna see what you're thinking about and how I can, uh, what questions that I can answer for you. So, uh, okay, so many people, very, very excited. The video and sound aren't in sync, I don't, I can't help you there. Uh, let's see. Kirsten wanted to know, are Mayflower's bones preserved or coated in something to keep them from disintegrating? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, when it comes to protecting and preserving bones like that, the first thing that happens is the bones get buried in the ground or covered in something like manure. And then all of the microbes in the soil or in the manure do the work of breaking down and removing a lot of the things that can cause the bones to disintegrate or decompose faster. After maybe six, seven months, they get dug up, checked. Maybe they need to go back into the manure or they may come out and just get a final scrub with some soap and water and then placed into uh, the museum collection. Of course, we do our best to maintain fairly consistent uh, humidity and temperature levels with our specimens so that they don't disintegrate or fall apart. But to my knowledge, and anybody in the chat who happens to know more than me about that particular question can jump in, but I don't believe that the bones are coated with anything in particular. They may have uh, some chemicals in them from like 1900 that were used, uh, but on that part, I'm not sure. What else do we got here? Uh, What's the shelf life on a dead whale? Sarah wants to know. Well, uh, let's see, 1896 to 2023. Do the math. There are even older specimens of whales in museums around the world. Uh, to my knowledge, they can last for a long time, right? It's the part of the bone, pretty much, it's just the calcium, it's just the minerals. The, uh, I'm going to say inorganic stuff, that might not be correct, but that's left. And so it should be able to hang out in the museum for a very long time. And of course, our mammal curators and our exhibits teams are constantly keeping an eye on these things. 
to look at things like wear and tear, deterioration, and to make decisions about whether they should stay on exhibit or whether they should come off and go into more climate controlled uh, places, better humidity control, uh, or if we need to do work on them to try to make sure that they last for a long time. The Ant Lab wants to know my favorite item on or off exhibit at the museum. Uh, well, Ant Lab, I, hmm, can I talk about it on this live stream? I guess so. Favorite thing that's inside the museum. Uh, you know, we have, this museum houses something like four and a half, maybe five million specimens from the natural world. That's pretty impressive. Picking favorites is pretty hard. I'll give you two. I'll give you two. Um, and they're very dramatically different from one another. One is actually just a model of something that's on exhibit. You can see it on the third floor of the older building of the museum, the Nature Exploration Center in the Mountain Cove exhibit. It's a little nocturnal corner of the museum. And right in the middle, there's a great horned owl that is just caught and killed, uh, a cottontail rabbit. And it's sitting there with it. It's about to tear into it. But if you look to the left of the owl, there's a little tree sapling. And hanging off of a branch of that tree are a pair of mating leopard slugs. It's a model of leopard slugs making babies, which in the estimation of Sir David Attenborough, the famous TV naturalist. Yeah, we know David Attenborough. Uh, he agrees with me that leopard mating slug, mating leopard slugs uh, is probably one of the most delicate mating rituals in the animal kingdom. They do this whole process. They secrete a thick mucus thread. They hang upside down from it. They slowly entwine their bodies around one another. Uh, the male sex organ in a slug actually emerges from a hole that opens up in the side of their head uh, and then dangles below them while they do the deeds uh, and fertilize eggs. I won't go into the whole thing. You can look it up on YouTube and find Attenborough talking about it, at least as well as I could, of course. Uh, but it is quite fascinating to see. I've seen it in person. And on my first day on the job here at the museum, I noticed that little model. And later I was talking to former director of exhibits here about it. Uh, and he hadn't remembered that it was there. So I felt quite special. And the exhibit panel in that part of the museum says nothing about mating leopard slugs. The second thing that I like is it's, well, we have a lot of them, but up on the third floor of the Nature Research Center, right next to the Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Lab is a big chunk of meteorite. It's called, uh, it's from Namibia. It's called the Gibeon meteorite. It was, sort of split up in the 1830s and people started sending pieces of it to museums. Um, but it fell in prehistoric times before people, um, but was actually found by the Nama people in Namibia and they would use it as a source of metals for like tools and weapons for a while. That's kind of cool. But I just like, it's on exhibit, the whole chunk of it, and you can touch the entire piece of the meteorite, of the Gibby meteorite. And it's a big piece of meteorite and you can put your hands on it. What I like about that is that meteorites are the remnants of the formation of the solar system. So they're the pieces of our solar system that didn't get conglomerated into planets or moons and things like that, that didn't end up as part of the asteroid belt. They're just whipping around the solar system looking for somewhere to land. Every now and then they land here. And in our museum, you get to touch one. And it is roughly 4.6 billion, billion with a B, years old. You can touch something that was around 4.6 billion years ago when the solar system, when the planets were only just beginning to come together and to coalesce into what we know of them as the, today. That I feel like is pretty special. And the Gibeon meteorite is tucked around a little corner off to the side where nobody sees it and nobody goes to touch it but it's right there for everybody to enjoy. So uh, I hope uh, looking at the questions, I know that I have missed more because normally I'm hosting and I have all of these pulled up and bookmarked. Um, but now I know that I'm probably just going to miss so many questions. Folks, you know where to find me. 
I'm right here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and I'd be happy to take questions from you. Send me an email, send me a tweet, send me a message on Instagram, however you want to find me. Uh, and I'm happy to do it. So folks, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, hearing a little bit about some of the cool stories behind the Museum of Natural Sciences. We will, of course, be here next week with another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. And in fact, to give you just a little preview of next week's show, I'm going to bring on next week's guest into the program to say hi. Everybody, next week we're going to be hearing from Space Case Sarah, and Sarah joins me now. Hello. Hey, Sarah, how are you? I'm good, although I'm a little upset about the meteorite now. Justice for the meteorite. Come on. Tucked <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> so give us, you know, 15, 20 seconds about what we can learn next Wednesday on the program from you. Well, I think the main reason that I was asked to join you um, is because I just was living on a, a research ship in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean for the last two months. I just got back a month ago from the um, from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, parked there for two months doing astrobiology research. And I am not a scientist per se, but I am a science communicator. And I was the onboard communications officer for this expedition, which was super exciting and actually ended up being one of the most geologically important expeditions that the ship has ever done. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. So we're going to, so we're going to hear about this trip. Yeah. Why it was important. Yes. Oh, and why we, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little teaser. I, we, oh, we, okay. so in the, in the, you know, sixties, there was this whole concept of project Moho, right. You know, we're going to reach the mantle and in this place in the Atlantic ocean, this is a unique spot where the mantle is rising up. So you can access ma mantle rock. It's just a really remote place to be able to do so. And the most mantle rock has ever been pulled up was a record of 200 meters set back in the nineties. And our ship ended up pulling up 1,267 meters of mantle rock. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think so, we're going to get some good stories next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's super exciting. And and it's all connected to space. I know that sounds so weird, but there's a huge space connection there, too. And that's why Space Case Era and myself got to go. I love it. I'm excited. That's going to be a great show. Yeah. Super exciting. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Everybody, go ahead, bookmark it, subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, click the bell to get notified, uh, sign up for the Lunchtime Discovery newsletter. That way you can get information about this program in your inbox every single week. That way you've got the link right there. You can just click and come join us for this program. We're doing some fun and great stuff over here, and we want you to be a part of it. So uh, from me and everybody at the Office of Environmental Education, and the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Thanks for tuning in today, everybody. Thanks for listening to me drone on for 60 minutes. And we'll see you again next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>